Are there reptilian aliens among us? I, I would say yes. Obviously, in movies, television shows, they're always showing these reptile alien creatures and motion pictures. Again, I am totally convinced for myself that Hollywood makes movies based on real things. Steven Spielberg, in one of his uh, interviews a couple of years ago, he said that I don't make movies to entertain, I make movies to comment on important subjects. I don't make movies to entertain. Well, he's made all kinds of movies about reptile aliens and Jurassic Park and ETs and extraterrestrials and all kinds of stuff like that he's famous for. And if he's not making those kinds of movies to, uh, to entertain, he's making them to uh, comment on important subjects. So even the likes of Steven Spielberg feel this is important. Incidentally, if you can imagine how much money it costs to finance Steven Spielberg to make a 90-minute movie, if you can just imagine, if you contract with him to be this, the executive producer to pay for a movie that he produces, can you imagine how much money it's going to cost you? Because he doesn't go cheap. Well, he made a 19 hours television series. 19 hours. Somebody financed him to the tune of 19 hours for Steven Spielberg to make a television series called Taken, in which that was one of his most important subjects in his life, is this concept of aliens taking people. Um, um, not just reptile aliens, but the whole concept of other world entities coming and kidnapping humans. And um, so it was called Taken. Well, the movie Taken was, was actually comes from a book by Dr. Carla Turner, a lady doctor, who was probably the best UFO researcher in the world. As far as I'm concerned, she was top of everybody, all the best UFO researchers. But Dr. Carla Turner was, in my, my opinion, she was a doctor, far, you know, some kind of a doctor before, but she got into the alien abduction subject, and what she, her work was just um, phenomenal. I mean, she did some serious work on this whole subject of alien abduction. And she began to get into the connections between the U.S. government and alien presence and how the U.S. government is working directly with the aliens. Soon after that, she was found dead, and her husband died later, immediately. After that came out, after she started talking publicly about the fact that the U.S. government is, in, is dealing directly with aliens and allowing these aliens to kidnap children, to kidnap people, kidnap humans, and are using them for experiments, um, she was found dead. What year was that? Uh, I'm not sure, too many years ago, and I still have her lectures. As a matter of fact, her lectures are on the web right now. Just go to uh, Google Video and type in Dr. Carla, K-A-R-L-A, Carla Turner, and listen to her and tell me if uh, it doesn't run, shows up and down your spine listening to this lady. She's very, very knowledgeable. She knew what she was talking about. And she's talking about the fact that when you hear people talking about these aliens, some of them being kind and, and good to us, etc., she said, you better go back and do your homework. This whole entire scenario of alien presence are entities from somewhere else who have come here into your planet, into your life. And uh, we don't know what their objective is and what their, what their uh, objects are. So... It's foolish to think that any of them are dear and, and good and good and benefactors. We don't know who they are or where they've come from. Undoubtedly, people in government know, but they're not talking. Well, she found out a lot, and that's why she's dead. But as I said, uh, Hollywood is telling us a lot of things about the world, and they put it into movies. And so the reptile alien has been around for a long time in TV shows, <coughs> and um, and even more so, um, 
this was in Time Machine. So reptile aliens, and then of course, as uh, as you know, in the both V, the first movie V, and the second one, um, these were reptile aliens who presented themselves as beautiful people, highly intelligent, very highly advanced, and um, the humans were taken in by them. Humans wanting to uh, uh, be on the side of the winner, so. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, I talked about the dawn of a new day in one of my videos, and in the and in V, the second one, they talked about exactly what I was saying they were going to say. They said in V that there was a dawn of a new day in which the whole world was coming under a new world order. And I've said for years that the symbol for the new world order was the dawn of a new day, and I had a video came out and talked about that <clears throat> months before this came out. So there is something to the <coughs> idea that Hollywood and government, military, are totally aware that there is an alien connection going on right now in point of fact, uh, and, and Hollywood is putting it out into movies, uh, military is doing it undercover, and government is acting like there's nothing, nothing to it at all. But um, I think that there's something very, very frightening going on. I think we are being invaded. <clears throat> The whole concept of the reptile aliens look like humans. Well, that's not new. I mean, that's even in the Bible. The Bible says God made man in his own image and likeness. And I've talked to all of them. I've talked to so many rabbis about this subject. First of all, the word God in the Bible, in Genesis 1, 1, when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the word God is El Elohim. It's a feminine plural. It's not one God. It's gods, more than one. And then when you get into what kind of gods, well, they were, they were supposedly, according to Hebrews, they had scales. They were scaly gods, the Elohim, who created us. So, and we could talk about that too. I've got a lot of stuff on that. But the whole idea is that these reptile aliens are in motion pictures, they're in sci-fi magazines, of course, they're everywhere. And almost all of them have a ridge on their skull, a raised uh, flange or a ridge on, on, the, on their head. I thought that was interesting a long time ago, and I picked up on that and started uh, doing some research on that, that this ridge or this raised part part on the head of the skull. Of course, we have the history of reptile aliens, and probably one of the most interesting books, and there's so many books on the history of reptile aliens on the earth, but this one's called Flying Saucers and Dragons, the Story of Mankind's Reptilian Past. And uh, this is published by Book Tree Publishing, my our dear friends here who publish our books for us, um, in San Diego. It's called Flying Serpents and Dragons. Excellent book on tracing the ancient history, medieval history, and modern day history of aliens interacting with humans, a reptile alien interacting with humans. I mean, all of our stories coming out of the Bible showing reptile aliens. So, you know, we got a hell of a long past of humans' intervention with aliens. Here in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and you'll see the serpent is upright, standing upright, uh, conversing with Eve. Alien inter interaction and inter uh, interplay between aliens and humans. Uh, one one Hebrew uh, Jewish source on the Bible says, "Were well, Adam and Eve human?" We're all familiar with the Old Testament account of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and how they ate the forbidden fruit. But what is not widely known is that there were other ancient religious documents that describe this, this event and tell us of a different and startling story. In the, uh, in the, in the Jewish writings, the Haggadah, the wellspring of Jewish oral, uh, oral tradition uh, says the first result was that Adam and Eve became naked before their bodies had been overlaid with a horny skin and enveloped in a cloud of glory. 
And uh, then it goes on to say, no sooner have they violated the command given them, um, then the cloud of glory, then their horny skin dropped from them. And it talks about the second uh, quote was from another uh, source. This is a Christian Gnostic text. Talks about how now Eve uh, believed the words of the serpent. She at she looked at the tree, and she took some time. Uh, she took some of its fruit and ate, and she gave her husband also, and he ate too. Then their mind opened, and they ate, and the light of knowledge shone for them. They knew that they were naked <coughs> in regard to knowledge, and when they saw their their makers, when they saw their makers, they loathed them. Since they were beastly forms, they understood very much. So even in the old Gnostic Christian text talking about the makers or the creators of mankind were beastly in form. And if that's the case, then uh, we were made the image and likeness of our creator. And so when we were made, the, uh, the Jewish writings say we had horny skins. So... Uh, and so the ancient world always showed kings and rulers and princes connected to serpents, <coughs> serpent queens. <coughs> some, some of the uh, scientific books are theorizing if the dinosaurs um, somehow or another were able to evolve into um, other kind of creatures over millions of years. And of course there's um, Nicholas de Berry. Uh, he was a grand master of the uh, dragon's legacy, or the dragon's court in Europe. Um, Sir, what was his name? Uh, what was the name of that uh, British writer that died, that did all the work on the bloodlines? Do you remember? Who was that? Um, a thin writer, I can't remember his name right now. Sir Lawrence Gardner. Lawrence Gardner. So Lawrence Gardner wrote a, quite a few books, large books about the bloodlines of the Holy Grail, about Jesus, bloodlines, etc. And a uh, very famous author, and I knew him well. We did some lectures together. Well, I found out later that Nicholas de Verre was a co-author in Europe with Sir Lawrence Gardner. But Lawrence Gardner didn't tell Americans that. That uh, most of the knowledge that Lawrence Gardner was bringing out in his books that we were reading here about the bloodlines of the royalty of Europe and the royalty of the bloodlines of Jesus and all that kind of thing. He was getting a lot of his information from Nicholas de Verre, who was <clears throat> a grand master in the Dragon's Court in Europe, a secret society, a very powerful ancient old order where they worshiped the dragon the uh, reptile alien gods, and this is a very legitimate society, and, it's a, and it, this is what, um, um, what was his name, and Vlad, uh, they called him uh, Vlad the Impaler, who was this, what was the term they gave him? Dracula. Dracula. Dracula was actually a real man, he was a prince, and uh, he was very bloodthirsty, and, uh, but he belonged to, and at the time, Dracula was um, the, the head of the Dragon's Court. Today, Nicholas de Verre is the head of the Dragon's Court. And so, Nicholas talks about, um, his book is called The Dragon's Legacy, The Secret History of the Ancient Bloodlines. And uh, on the bottom it says he's a Grand Master, Imperial Royal Dragon's Court. And so, as I said, he's, uh, he writes a lot about the concept of the reptile aliens who have ruled Europe behind the scenes. Wouldn't surprise me. Of course, in statues all over the world, statues of aliens, reptile aliens. I saw this one in England when I was in uh, England speaking on tour. I went to a UFO uh, exhibit. This guy had an incredible museum of all kinds of reptile aliens. And on the back wall, he would have the quotes from the reference books, from the Bible and reference books, uh, describing, you know, what you were seeing. So it wasn't like he was making these up. He was just showing you where this information came from and then designed creatures that looked like what, what was on the document. 
and um, you see the connection between the ancient reptile uh, dinosaurs and what the human evolved could possibly look like. And as I said, there are statues uh, all over Europe and implying that humans are being dominated by reptile aliens. Uh, Quetzalcoatl, also pictured as a reptile in Mexico. This is in, uh, I think it's in Finland. I think it's in Finland. Um, one of the Nordic countries where it shows a man being uh, molested by a reptile alien. Is that Gustav Wigland in Oslo? Yeah, could be. That's right, it was in Oslo. And now the woman. Yeah. Incredible. The eyes, the eyes of reptile aliens, reptiles, first of all. Reptile eyes. The large eye uh, aliens that we are told, and the ancient people made statues of these alien creatures they said they saw. Here's one from uh, Kosovo, going back to the Neolithic period. You see it looks like an alien with the, uh, with the skin, the eyes. Why would these ancient people make representation of these creatures that they saw and they look like reptiles? Well, because they very well might have been reptiles. This is from Sumeria, the old Babylonian, Akkadian, Sumeria area of the world, Middle East. Um, quite literally, a reptile head, reptile eyes. <clears throat> Lord of the Rings makes the reptile eyes. That's pretty uh, extraordinary stuff when you when you think about the possibility that maybe there had been for thousands of years before humans were on the earth. This may have been inhabited by a reptilian race. The human brain. With inside the, between the two lobes of the human brain, uh, down the middle, there is something called the reptilian brain. I've talked to doctors about this, and they say, yeah, that's the correct term to use. As a, there's a part of the human brain between the two lobes in the middle called the reptilian brain. And um, they say that when a human is developing in the womb, that it develops like a reptile. It has a tail, it has all the um, accoutrements of a reptile, lizard or whatever, and then it begins to begins to fill out and become more human. But when it's actually in the in the formative stages, it looks like a reptile. And then of course we have a reptile complex in the brain. It's called the reptilian complex in the brain. So, um, you know, you've got to wonder why would science and, and medical science call this area in the brain the reptilian? Also in comic magazines, <clears throat> obviously, all kinds of comics over the, over the years have always shown uh, reptiles actually at war, you know, wearing <clears throat> uniforms. So they're not just animals, they are actually intelligent creatures. Aztecs and Mayas. Now the strange crescent heads that I talked about, these strange crest heads, is what caught my attention many, many years ago. As a matter of fact, I did a video on this quite a long time ago, uh, but I think it's so important I'm redoing it. The same idea of this crested head, this crest on the heads of reptiles and birds also. Birds are connected to the reptile world. So when you see those uh, reptiles with these crested heads, I picked up on this, as I said many years ago, thinking about this, saying, wait a minute, crested heads. Here's a, here's a skull, you see the crest is a natural part of the skull. Natural part of the skull. This is not that important because we see it in all the reptiles, until you start applying it to humans. Now once, you, once we've established this is a reptilian a, a trait, 
and reptiles. Here it's called the helmeted lizard, which you'll see the reptile um, connection between the reptile alien and the uh, lizard with the crested head. Then, uh, as we saw just before, from Sumeria, uh, Sumeria, you see these reptile gods of men and women, crested heads. The heads of these figurines were styled by some, uh, they look reptilian, lizard-headed. And I'm just of the opinion that people back in the little ancient world, uh, you know, were not dreaming this up for Hollywood. They were just making uh, statues of things they've actually seen. So I would be, as I said, wouldn't be a bit surprised that there are and has been on this earth reptile, intelligent reptilian creatures on this earth. And that's what our ancient ancestors were trying to tell us. But this crested head bothered me because I see it in not only magazines and cartoons, but then you begin to see it in everywhere. Um, this crest on the heads of these aliens. And they're always green, the reptilian. Then here's a giant uh, statue in uh, Persia with the crest on his head. Uh, prehistoric pictures drawn on walls with the crested heads. This is a disc that was found in the Middle East. And on this disc, uh, a lot of interesting symbols on this disc, but one of them is um, uh, a man with a crested headdress. And of course, here in the Aztecs and the Mayas, they have their gods with this crested head. And uh, here's a deity, a serpent having a plume on its head. So the more I got into this whole idea, this plume or crested head on these gods, and there's a serpent with the symbol too. Yeah, the Aztecs and Mayas also had um, their gods had crested headdresses. Which is implying, in my mind, that there's some connection between that, that normal thing which we see on reptiles and it's applying it to humans. <coughs> and see, here's one of the ancient gods of the Assyrians with that same idea of the crested head dress, uh, crested head. In Africa, some of the gods, modern day. And then of course the Greeks and the Romans, their helmets were crested hair dresses, head dresses. So when you think about how the, this whole idea of this crested head um, has matured through the ages for thousands of years, and even the Mohawk Indians, the Mohawks had the same style crest and head dress. So I begin to suspect that there might be something to this idea of uh, a connection between here in Hawaii with God's crested <coughs> head. But what is the connection with these, uh, with this symbol of the uh, powerful gods in all the different nations of the world? And of course, in, uh, and this is in Hawaii, but then of course you have in Tibet, the Tibetans also have the same idea. So the question has to be asked, if, is it possible that there has been some kind of an interplay interfacing of humans with extraterrestrials and reptile aliens? I think so. I think that's what's happened. And I think they're here. Now, I'm totally sure because I've heard, well, as I said, way too many stories that validate the idea that they are here, but they don't necessarily show themselves to everybody. Uh, if they're superior to us, which obviously they are, because they've either been here millions of years before we got here, or they've come here from somewhere else, and we haven't gone there, so they're superior to us, wherever they have come from. And when you look into Skinwalker Ranch, 
which I started talking about before, and the stuff that's actually happening right now today at Skinwalker Ranch with these kind of reptile aliens showing up on people's property. They're getting pictures of them. They're having confrontations with these reptile aliens. Uh, scientists have been out there, news people have been out there, so they do exist. So you've got to explain them somehow. Either they're interdimensional beings, or they've come here from somewhere else, or they've always been here. Maybe we're the new guys on the block, and they've always been here. And we've heard all these stories about underground um, uh, installations and underground military uh, operations with reptile aliens. I've heard all kinds of stories from military people about that. So I would not be a bit surprised if we are being visited by other entities from other places in the universe, and we have been for a long time. It's just that we're so uh, busy with our everyday lives, we don't take notice. But once in a while, as I said, things will start to happen for you personally. It sounds crazy to people that have had an experience, but once you've had an experience with something otherworldly, then it becomes very plausible that something is happening here. If you see something in your bedroom, or see an uh, angel, or spirits, poltergeist, demons, whatever, it just implies that your physical world is not the only one that's here. There's something else going on while you're here. Christians know about it, the Jewish traditions know about it, the Hindus and all the other ancient religions of the world talk about the reptile aliens and the, and the gods who created us and all that kind of thing. All I'm saying is all, the only thing I want to to really drive home in this presentation is the fact that there's a very good possibility that humans have a reptilian past and that they, whoever it is has created us very well could be a reptile in principle and have been able to evolve or recreate themselves and are using us today. That's why when I talked with David Icke about this, uh, he had never heard the concept and I said, well, I'm not, no, I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying, looking at all the evidence, it begins to look like there's something going on here. So, <clears throat> I am of the opinion that there's, as I said so many times, that the, nothing you see in this world is what you think it is. Nothing. You're looking at things that you think you understand, and it's not, not true at all. I mean, our courts do not do what they say they do. The police are not here to do what they say they do. The government does not do what it says it's going to do. Nothing is what you think it is. It's far, far bigger and far deeper. And again, when you get people like Steven Spielberg doing 19-hour television series on the concept of aliens um, kidnapping humans, he must believe that pretty big to do 19 hours. It's called Taken. You can buy it in the stores. Um, and. I don't know if you know this or not, but George Lucas was on television with Spielberg not too long ago, and he said that uh, they were talking about 2012, December 2012, and it was Lucas's opinion, not Spielberg, but Lucas said, and his, it was his opinion that 2012, December was the end of the world, as far as he was concerned. The whole world was going to be destroyed. Somehow or another, there was going to be some cataclysmic event that all life, life on the earth is it's all gone. It's all going to be gone. And, and when he said that, Spielberg raised his eyes to say, you know, well, you know, it's not me. I didn't say that. He said that. But to have somebody like George Lucas say that in public, that he believes he's not stupid. And he said, I'm totally convinced that December of 2012, the human race is finished. We're, it's all gone. And what was in the movie is going to be child's play to what's coming. Well, I don't know. I have no idea. My gut feeling is that, that 2012 is not going to bring destruction. It's going to bring an awakening. And I think it's going to bring some kind of a spiritual awakening that people are not ready for. I don't think people, generally speaking, want to be awakened. So I think that whoever it is that has control over us and our, over our minds, and obviously somebody does, because somebody is running the whole planet. And no matter how crazy we are, no matter how violent we are, and how stupid we are, the whole world seems to work. Somehow or another, seems to work with all the wars and crime and violence and drugs and shooting people, but the whole world continues to operate. And the rich get richer and the poor get poorer and things go on. 
So it shows me that there's some kind of a higher intelligence that's ripping us off, raping us, destroying us. But they keep it running, they keep the, they keep the circus going so that they uh, get more children being born, more, more humans coming into the system. So I basically boils down to the fact that I believe that we are created, we are somebody else's creation. We have been created as an entity by someone else. And whoever it is that has created us, they're not human, obviously, because we're, we're trying to catch up on, on the science that the Egyptians have, we can't even understand. So that's another important point about history, <clears throat> is that we're not, we're not gaining, we're not evolving, we are devolving. We're not getting smarter as we go, we're getting stupider as we go. Because when you look at the ancient world, and I do mean the prehistoric and ancient world, they knew and understood technology that we can't even figure out today. We're still trying to figure out how the ancient Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Akkadians knew what they did, how they could figure out the universe. They knew the, how much the sun weighed. They wrote down how the distance between the different planets and, and how, much, how big the earth was, how much it weighed. They went on and on and on writing about all kinds of strange things that we don't even understand today. And so much of our, our occult sciences are based on the ancient Hindus, the Sumerians, uh, that we're trying to study what those people were talking about. Obviously, they were far advanced than we were, and that we've been getting dumber as we go down the line. So that today, uh, it's an extraordinary situation that all over the world, people are totally ignorant, ill-informed, unread, dim-witted, and if you, if you try and present something which is out of the ordinary, you're going to be looked at as, as must be an Al-Qaeda agent or, a, or an imbecile. <laughs> yeah, it must be something wrong with you. Because, you know, because everybody knows the important things people need to talk about and think about is dancing with the stars and football and all the other <laughs> silly ass things, games that our masters give the children to play with. But, uh, but if you're serious-minded about where we came from and who created us and where we're going, I think looking at this whole idea of the reptilian past uh, might be a good place to start. I was told about ten different stories and, uh, of, of reptilian, people who have had reptilian um, connections, and, and each one of those stories was phenomenal. And, and each one, as I said, was very, very powerful stories but very powerful people. And uh, one of them was a very wealthy um, man in Las Vegas who buys and sells hotels and, and gambling casinos. And um, he told me about his company. Um, they, they, he said once a year uh, he takes all his employees, or like eight guys in the company, and they all belong to the same church. I was doing a radio show in Las Vegas and he called me after the show and told me of his experience. And he said every year they go on a vacation somewhere. And he said then, uh, this was in 1989 when I got the phone call. And he said last year, which was in 1988, he said last year we went to Colorado and we were backpacking and, and, and camping in Colorado, eight families. And he said we were out in the middle of nowhere camping. And he says then one morning we got up, we broke camp and we, went up to the top of a ridge to overlook the valley and down in the valley was uh, was a cleared off round area where someone had cleared off the trees and everything it was a round area and we saw a circle of people standing in the valley all of them holding hands in a circle and they were chanting and swaying back and forth and chanting some kind of a ritual and there was a priest or someone in the middle and he said well we put peace up over to see them we were up on the mountain we were looking down on them um, all of a sudden in that circle appeared another entity. It just popped in, much bigger than the person that was there. And it pointed up at us, and the chanting stopped, all the singing stopped, and everyone looked it up and pointed up at us. And he said, we don't know what to think of this, but happily we're up here in the mountains and we're getting out of here quick. And he said, so we turned around to leave, and there was a reptile alien standing behind us. And the one that was that came in, it was a reptile alien, it was standing directly behind us. And he said, when we turned around to leave, this thing stood there looking at us. That's how fast it moved. 
And he said, and the children, everyone was paralyzed. You couldn't move, you couldn't cry, you couldn't move, you couldn't do anything. So he said, everyone agreed that the most they could do is just draw breath to stay alive. That's all they could do. They could not speak, couldn't do anything. Even the children could do nothing. And he said, we were all paralyzed and looking at this thing. And he said, this reptile alien looked at us. He said, it was about seven foot tall, maybe taller, was extremely muscular, had a reptile head, reptilian body. And he said, but uh, it just looked at us. And it said to us telepathically, we understood it correctly, said, uh, I'm going to let you go. But what I do, you better get out of here because you've interrupted my, you know, my ritual. And so when he said that, the reptile alien turned and then he turned back around and looked at him one more time to emphasize, you know, you better leave. And he said, when it turned, it was gone. Instantly, it was just, boom, it was gone. And he said, when it left, the instant it left, the light came back into everybody. The women were screaming, the children were ranting and screaming, and everybody, he's including the men, we were running back to the car, we didn't come out of here big time. And he says, um, uh, today, all the eight guys still work for me, that's something, we're all Christians, we've never ever seen anything or heard anything like that in our life, but we all saw it, all families, all the children, everyone saw it. So he told me, so when you're talking about reptile aliens, I got news for you. Where there's at least one we know of that's in Colorado. <laughs> we were there. We saw it. So I'm saying that that's just one of about ten stories I've heard. Uh, there's another story out there that's on the web you really should listen to. Her name is Nancy. She's a, a sweet lady, a friend of mine named Nancy. Her father, she's probably one of the most interesting uh, people I've, I've run into in my life because I can sit and talk with her for hours. Her name's Nancy. Um, she's, uh, her father was uh, uh, an official with the Air Force. He worked in what she called Project Retrievables, which was any time uh, UFOs came down anywhere in the world, I didn't know this but until she told me, that any time UFO activity happens anywhere on the Earth, the United States Air Force is in charge. I don't care if it comes down in Russia, they have to call the United States Air Force. They do not send the Russian Air Force, they call the U.S. Air Force. If it comes down in China or Africa, it doesn't matter where it comes down, you call the U.S. Air Force, period. Which tells me that um, with all this hodgepodge about politics, the U.S. is the boss, period. Bottom line. And you may say what you want to about it, but we have the army, we got the guns, we got the money, and we are the boss, period. We catch you doing something you, you, that you weren't told. That's why the UN is in New York, the Empire State. This is the Empire, and we own it. And so, um, so the whole idea is that she said that her father was head of Project Retrievables, and that uh, he would. And there was a situation that no matter where they went in the world, she said, I was never in one place too long. We'd travel all over the world wherever my dad was stationed. And she said, um, wherever it is that we, we live, we almost always lived on a base. And she said, um, she, she went on telling me about all kinds of reptilian stories that her father told her. And um, <coughs> she said, but when the, we always had two telephones and one was a red telephone. And when that phone rang, you were never to answer that phone. If the phone rings, it would only ring a couple of times. It was not to be answered. It was a tip-off. When that red phone rings, that means your father has within five minutes to be prepared, dressed, with a briefcase ready to go. Because in five minutes from that telephone ring, the military would pick him up. And she said, I've been there many times when that happened. The military you know, knocked on the door and would say nothing. There were no words spoken at all. Everybody knew what they had to do, and, and he would just walk out, open the door, go down to the car, get in the car, and drive off. And when he would drive off, four other military guys would come on the property, even though it's on the base, would come on the property, on um, all four corners of the house, and stay there until the father got home. And if it was a week, or two weeks, or a month, every morning, all night, there would be four guys guarding the house, or even on the, on the military property. And she said that one night, 
uh, she always wanted to be left by herself, and the father would never allow her to be left anywhere by herself. And you'll hear this on on her uh, on her uh, if you go on the web um, to audio to the video and then put in reptilian aliens uh, Nancy I think it is and listen to her tell the story. But she said one night she asked her mother because her mom and dad were going next door to a party. And uh, she asked her mom and dad if she could stay by herself in the house, and her father said no. So she moaned to her mom, and her mother talked the father into letting him her stay. And so he agreed, because the mother uh, wanted it. So he agreed. And so when she said when they left, a little while after they left, she said, I was in my bedroom, combing my hair, looking in the mirror, and she said that my closet door was like a French door opening on the closet. She said, while I was combing my hair, a reptile alien stepped out of the closet, but he had to step down to get out from under the header. And he stood up, almost touching the ceiling, and looked at her. She said, I'm looking in the mirror, looking at this thing, and it's looking at me. And she said, it began to move toward me without walking. It just began to float slowly toward me. And she said, I got the feeling it's like coming up on a fly, you know. So she said, I got up and ran down the hallway and ran into the bathroom, threw the window open, shut the door, and started screaming bloody murder. And she said, everybody in the neighborhood heard, and everybody come running to the house. She said, when I opened the window, I heard this thing come down the hall. It was very heavy. You could hear it walking coming down the hall. And it began growling and scratching on the door and growling like an animal and scratching on the door. And she said, and when my dad and all the guys came in, uh, come running up, they were all yelling and coming running up to the house. This thing turned around and ran back into the bedroom. And the father came in with the, with the other people and they got her out and the door, she said, was just clawed. So this thing was, was a material creature. It wasn't just a vision. And she said that the father told the mother this is why I never wanted her to be left alone, because these reptile aliens have told us they're tired of the Air Force coming to put their nose in our business. Every time something happens with us, you guys come out and put your nose in our business. So he said, they told me, the next time you go out to put your nose in our business, we're going to come visit your daughter. So just know that. When you come out and put your nose in our business, we're going to send one to, to put our nose in your business. And he said they, they could have killed her. They didn't. They didn't. They, they didn't kill her. They wanted to scare the family, let the family know, you know what we could have done. This is a warning. So that was scary, just hearing that story. And I, like I said, I got about eight or nine more of them. So all these stories seem to, as far as I'm concerned, imply that there is some kind of a reptilian past. That's why I don't have any problem with it. Um, as I said, I've never seen one. If you have any questions about it, I don't, I don't know that I'll have any answers, but if you have any questions about the general subject, because I'm totally convinced that we are the creation of somebody who has created us and we look like them. You know, there are insects that can hide themselves. Some insects can sit on a tree and look like a leaf. Some insects look like a little branch until they move. Some insects look like there's a, there's a, in, in Africa, there's army ants. These army ants are terrible, but they're murderous ants. But there's a little small creature that is about the size of an army ant, but it's not an ant. But it looks kind of like an army ant, and it's able to live with the army ants. And they don't bother, because they, they assume he's one of them. And he smells the same as the army ants. He eats what they eat. And so this little creature, which is not an ant, is right there in the middle of a, of a nest of army ants, and nobody bothers him because he smells the same, he looks the same, and nobody knows that he's not an ant. And I think to myself, with animals and insects that can, that can mimic uh, other things around them, who is to say these reptile aliens cannot mimic what we look like if they created us? Who knows what they can do? We know that our government has got technology that can, can can electrically put into your brain things for you to see that are not there. We know that they've been doing that for years. They, we have uh, all kinds of technology developed 
to have you see ghosts and, and, and entities and stuff. And if, uh, and if all these other people I've talked with the military are right, the U.S. military is involved, in point of fact, with aliens. And Steven Spielberg is saying that in that 19 hour television series. Um, he's also saying it in uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And it shows how the military is out there in the desert, uh, you know, waiting for the saucer to come in. <coughs> There was no big news to them. They were waiting for it. They were all set up ready. Why? Because they, they've been doing it for years. And, and incidentally, that movie, uh, in Close Encounters, when those when the flying saucer finally landed and all those military people, the Navy guys, got off, that actually was, in fact, based on the fact that they, those were the people who were uh, lost out of the Bermuda Triangle. There have been many Navy people who have been lost over the Bermuda Triangle, and those names are correct, and he put it in the movie. Mm -hmm. So what Spielberg, Spielberg was saying is that these planes that have been lost over the Bermuda Triangle, and the pilots that were lost uh, chasing UFOs, well, they weren't lost, they were, they were kidnapped by the, uh, by the aliens they thought they were chasing. No, you're not chasing the aliens. They don't, they don't get you to come to them. And so... Um, there's a lot of strange things going on in the in the, uh, in the Bermuda Triangle that defy your imagination, to totally defy anything you can you can dream of. Uh, stuff that's going on right now in the Bermuda Triangle. But what's interesting about the Bermuda Triangle is that on the other side of the Atlantic, in the Azores and the uh, and like the Canary Islands, and incidentally, Canary was the name of a kind of a dog, not not, not birds. Uh, canine dog, and call it Canary Islands, but uh, from the Bermuda Triangle across the Atlantic coast to Africa, or off the coast of Africa, is another spot just like the Bermuda Triangle, but something different happens there. There, in that area around the, the, uh, the uh, Canary Islands, are many, many, many hundreds of ships, boats, tankers, uh, instead of being lost, sinking and being lost forever in the Bermuda Triangle, they, are, they, don't, they don't sink there in the Azores. They're found with no one on them. Big oil tankers, large cargo ships with no humans on them. And they're just sitting out there. And so that's one of the things that the African government's out there you know, to, to take these ships, because if a ship is left completely deserted on the open sea, then whoever takes it, they own it. That's according to uh, maritime law. So if, if, if there's a ship out there and nobody's on it, you take it, then it's yours. Because it's, an, it's on open water, it's not on any land uh, or, or within the 12-mile limit, so it's on the open sea. Whoever owns it, owns it. And so they are discovering that uh, ships, large ships, from all over the world are found out there yachts and smaller boats too. But nobody's on them. Which means somebody is taking the humans off of these ships and leaving the ships. And that's a fact. And it's not just one or two, there's hundreds of cases when you begin to go back and look at what's going on in the Canary Islands or what they call the area called the Azores. There's Lots of ships being uh, being found, but nobody on them. So that alone is scary to me. That, that, you know, that, that's a mystery. Uh, just one more, one more mystery that we don't know anything about. And uh, some of the stuff that's come out of the Bermuda Triangle. One, one story came out of the Bermuda Triangle uh, was particularly fascinating. There's two books out. Um, on this, on this subject, um, uh, I'll try to remember the name of them. I'll, I'll put them on my website soon. But they were talking about how the U.S. Coast Guard, I think it was the Yamato, the U.S. Coast Guard was out in the Bermuda Triangle and it was very, very foggy. And it was in the after, late afternoon, extremely foggy, and they were going very slow, blowing the horns to let anybody know that's out there and they, they were coming through. And uh, the radar guy came in and told the captain, Captain, you got to stop the ship. There's an island right in front of us. And the captain said, we're in the middle of the book. 
and the ocean. There is no island. He said, no, that may be true, but there's an island in front of us. And it's in the Navy logs. It's in the Navy record. record that, the, uh, that, that the radar guy told the captain, there is an island in front of us. Stop the ship. So the captain stopped the ship, checked it, and it was. There's a big island on the radar. And he said, so they blew the horns and put on their, their big bright lights and moved into the fog toward them slowly. And he said that, that all of the men on the ship saw this island sitting right there, but it was above the water, about eight feet above the water. And from where they were, you could see under the island. And it was a beautiful island, but it was above the water. This is the United States Navy in their records saying, this is what we saw. The captain said, I don't know, I'm just telling you what we saw. There's an island sitting out there, but it's not touching the water surface. And he said, we pulled right up to it and shined our lights on it. And it was very, 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 very physical. We don't know what to do about it. We backed off. And he said, we backed off. I gave the order, turn the thing around and get out of here. Because I don't know what this represents and I don't want to know. So... I'm just saying, lots of strange things happened in the Bermuda Triangle. And if you were to draw a triangle on the globe, uh, the Bermuda Triangle on the globe, it goes straight through the Earth. It comes out of the south of the Sea of Japan. And that's the same identical triangle with the same uh, uh, measurements. It's called the Devil's Triangle in the Orient. And, and, the, uh, and commercial airlines... Uh, Japanese airlines, Korean airlines, many, many stories about seeing UFOs coming in and out of that triangle, going into the ocean and coming out. Uh, Albert Einstein theorized that the, uh, the Bermuda Triangle was connected to the Devil's Triangle. Well, obviously something's connected because it's doing the same thing, but he said that that was a vortex for extraterrestrials to come in. And it was opened by Nikolai Tesla and, uh, and the Philadelphia experiment. That before the Philadelphia experiment, we weren't seeing this kind of stuff going on. But after the Philadelphia experiment, there was um, an opening of the time-space continuum. And so somehow or another, there must have been some kind of a protective coat around the Earth, whoever created us, put a protective shield around the earth, and we know there are all kinds of shields that protect us from the sun and, and, the, and the rays out there, but there's some kind of a shield that we didn't even know was there that protects us spiritually from other alien civilizations being able to come in freely. Some kind of a shield that these extraterrestrials who created us put around the earth to protect their, their, their laboratory that they're working in. And uh, the, the, the Philadelphia experiment ripped a hole in the time-space continuum. And, uh, and now it's, these aliens are able to come in through that time-space continuum hole. Doc, I don't know if you've ever heard his name, but there's a, a very famous physicist, um, um, Tom Bearden. Have you ever heard of Tom Bearden? Okay, well, Tom Bearden is a fascinating man. I've known him for many years, I've known him a long time, and we've talked often, and one night we were at dinner over in Pasadena, there was a bunch of speakers, we had all been speaking at a conference over in Pasadena, and we all went out to dinner, the speakers did, and everybody who was anybody on the speakers list was there, uh, Zachariah Sitchin was there, and, and Tom Bearden, and, and Bob Beck, Dr. Bob Beck, and Bill Jenkins of ABC News. Um, Vladimir Tajinsky from, from Russia was there. All, and uh, all the different speakers were all there at the dinner. And I got in because of Bill Jenkins at ABC. He was a good friend of mine, so he invited me in. That was a long time ago. But <clears throat> so we were sitting around talking, and, and, and Norio Hayakawa was there. And Norio is very famous for uh, his work with Area 51. But Norio was there too, and so... When I, and I was just listening to the conversation with all these brilliant guys talking. I'm just sitting listening. And finally the conversation boiled down and, and it was kind of quiet. So I chirped up and said, uh, <clears throat> I said, um, Tom, Tom Bearden, I said, Tom, what can you tell me about the Philadelphia experiment? And he said, Jordan, I'm not at liberty to talk about that. Because I know he's military. He said, I'm not at liberty to talk about that. 
And so being a fool, I, you know, all I did to open my mouth and change feet, I said, um, <clears throat> I said, well, I don't want you to tell me any national secrets, but is there anything you can tell me at all? And he says, and he said it this way, listen to what I'm saying. I cannot talk about that subject. Now drop it. And in front of everybody, I felt like a fool. Well, this was very serious. This man was serious. I'm not talking about that. Don't even bring it up. Well, I looked back on it, and I talked to him later. I looked back on that, and I think he answered my question. I wanted to know, is there something serious about this? You're damn right it's serious. In front of everybody, he's not talking, period. So just don't even ask. Well, that tells me there is something serious to it. And then when I started doing all the research on Nikolai Tesla and Dr. Uh, Jessup, Philip Jessup, who committed suicide and left a letter saying why he worked on the Philadelphia experiment and why he killed himself, I think he shot himself. His letter basically said he could not live with what he had done. He had opened up a time-space continuum, which opened up <coughs> our Earth to extraterrestrial light, and they realized what they had done once they did it. They didn't know it was there. But uh, the Philadelphia experiment, in fact, opened a, a time-space continuum. And now the Earth is, uh, is, can be invaded by other aliens. Some kind of a technology the aliens had to protect each other uh, has been broken, in our case. And now they can come and go as they want. So we are sitting ducks because we humans, we don't even know what the President of the United States is doing, much less what aliens from other worlds are doing. And of course the President doesn't even know what he's doing. But it's a fascinating story about mankind's connections with um, the other world. And the alien, uh, reptile alien story plays a big part in all of this. And this whole idea of the, of the crested heads of the, as I said, the Hindu, and the uh, Tibetan monks, the Hawaiians, the uh, Mohawk Indians. What is all of this stuff really about? And when I was in Hawaii, I've been there about 12 times and I've done a lot of lectures over in Hawaii. And, and I was told that um, when you see these girls doing these dances and these men doing their fire dances, I've been told by, I've been told by some of the, the, the priests over there but these are not entertainment dances. These are specific kind of dances which are done to honor the gods. And that if you are a dancer, if you do anything wrong, you will pay for it. You, you, the, every move that you make is choreographed um, because the way they explain it, <coughs> you do any one thing wrong in, in the dance and you could die for it. If you're going to be a dancer, if you're going to be a performer in any of those ritual dances, you better know what you're doing because they're being watched by aliens, they're being watched by the gods. And they have a very specific moves that, that they have designated you do in that ritual. And so it's an actual blood ritual when those dances are. So when you see those Hawaiians doing these fire dances and all that, it's very beautiful and very interesting. No, no, it's more than that. You mess up on doing something like that, and you go home, and you may die. And that's why if you take a rock or anything, and I've been told that too, if you take anything, any pebble or something from the beach, you take it back to the mainland, you'll wish the hell you hadn't. You'll send that thing back. Because people say when they take, take rocks or anything from Hawaii and bring it here, you have just bought, bought yourself a lot of trouble. You're going to have demonic problems. You're going to have things that come into your bedroom at night. You better take that thing and send it back to Hawaii because you're messing with the property of the gods. And you know, and then when we see their gods have reptile and crested heads and alien looking creatures. So I'm I'm totally convinced that we are the product of an alien race, that we have been um, molded into what we are today and being manipulated by, and that's why I have no respect for religion, but government. Philosophy has a lot to say, but the religion is based on some very ancient, dark stuff that people don't know anything about. I talk a lot about that, because that's my favorite subject. I am totally convinced that astrology, when it's correctly understood, and it's not correctly understood, but, but astrology, when it's correctly understood, is a very, very powerful tool that the aliens have known and that they have allowed some of the humans to understand. 
and um, Nikolai Tesla, no, not Tesla, but uh, uh, the great astrologer Nostradamus figured out the real story on astrology. As far as I'm concerned, Nostradamus was the, the man who figured out how this stuff really works. And I've been, I've been in the company of people who are astrologers who, have, who do the astrology, the Nostradamus method. And the way they explain how Nostradamus did his calculation has nothing whatsoever to do with anything that astrology uh, today. It doesn't look like astrology at all. It is astrology in a sense, but it's not the kind of astrology you've ever heard. And uh, so, one other thing I think is important on that, yes? I just want to say, you know, when you're, since you're on astrology, the serpent is a big important thing in astrology. You know, the tail, the head, and all that, and talking with reptilians, it's not going to be a coincidence. Why? Well, not about it. Serpent plays a very big part with the Chinese, the Orientals, the dragons, dragon serpents, um, reptilian aliens. Yeah. <coughs> Too much smoke not to be a fire. Exactly. These people are not yeah. stupid. They're far a very, very highly intelligent. Um, just because they're Orientals, they don't look like us, it doesn't mean they're stupid. They are very, very bright and intelligent people, and they've got a hell of a past that we don't, and we in the West don't look at very closely. And um, But I have always been interested in the occult. The word occult simply means hidden. It has nothing to do with devil or evil or anything. You take the very concept of the Bible, the, old, the New Testament story of Jesus, the whole New Testament story of Jesus, in my opinion, is a metaphor. It's a symbolic story. That's why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. It's a story. It's a symbolic metaphor. It's a story that's telling you something. Like Aesop's fables. You tell a child a little a fable that teaches him something. We've all heard the story about the, 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 the tortoise and the, and the hare, the tortoise and the rabbit the race between the tortoise and the rabbit. And you talk to a little child, five years, four years old, and tell them about a race between a tortoise and a rabbit. Well, obviously the rabbit can run fast and the tortoise barely moves. And so the idea was in the story that the tortoise was moving so slow in this race that the rabbit ran very fast and got right up to the goal line and was so pompous and arrogant he <coughs> lay down to, to rest for a while because the tortoise is way back there. And he fell asleep and the tortoise finally crossed the goal line while the, tortoise, while the rabbit was sitting, and so he won, he won the race. You're explaining that to a child so that the child grows up and understands the principle. Just because you're handsome, good-looking, got plenty of money like Presley, doesn't mean you, you're going to win the race. <clears throat> you're going to end up dead, uh, you know, at 35 years old, or in a motorcycle accident or something. Just because you have a lot of stuff going for you doesn't mean anything. There are people who are 90 years old, lived three times your length of your life, and have beautiful families, and are very happy. While well, you're on drugs, or you know, unemployed, at one time you look like, a, you know, that you had everything going for you. So it doesn't matter, the, like the Bible says, the swift don't have the race. Just because you're swift, maybe 20, minutes, 20 seconds before the end of the race, you trip and break your neck. But just because you're fast, it doesn't mean you're going to win the race. We'll see who's going to win the race. Wait till it's over. It ain't over till it's over. And so you teach children these stories, these little metaphors and little symbolic stories to teach them concepts and ideas and, 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 and explain to them morality, ethics, and scruples, etc. I think that's what the New Testament and the Bible is. I think it's a, it's a story that's explaining symbolically a very ancient, ancient story. That's why it's called the greatest story ever told. Of course it's the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. And it's the same old story that has ever been told. The oldest story in the world is the war between light and darkness. Between God's Son, the light of the world. Of course the Son is the light of the world. So God's Son is the light of the world and his, his bitter enemy is his brother, the Prince of Darkness. And the prince of darkness in Egypt was called Set. So we say today, when it gets dark, it's God's son, Set. So he's the prince of darkness. Now God's son, who was the light of the world, is going to die. But he promised he would return. 
Yeah, right, every morning about 5.30, he returns. He promised he would return. But now that he's going to die, he's going to leave the whole world in the hands of the Prince of Darkness. But don't worry, he will come back and he will save us from the Prince of Darkness. And he does. And so we call him our risen Savior. Of course it's risen. 5.30 every morning, that's what the sun does, it rises. And it chases away the Woody Band and, and the Prince of Darkness. And so it's the war. The Bible story about Jesus is actually a metaphor for the oldest story in the world, the war between light and darkness, between intellectual, spiritual enlightenment and human stupidity, ignorance, and goofball, airhead, religion, government, and silly nonsense, and, and dancing with the stars and football. It's the war between intellectual, spiritual superiority of the human mind to understand. That's why someone who is bright, we say this person is very bright. Bright is a word we're using in relation to light. If he's really bright, we say he's brilliant. Brilliant as means very bright light. Why? Because listening to him, it lights up your world. You begin to see things you never saw before. You begin to experience a concept and ideas you've never heard before. And then you walk away, wow, I never knew this existed. I never knew that. Never, never thought about that. Well, that's because the guy's brilliant. And so when you understand how Egypt the, 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 the uh, teachings in Egypt about God's Son, the light of the world. Of course, he had 12 helpers. Well, of course, the, the God's Son has 12 helpers. 12 signs of the zodiac, 12 months of the year. And uh, 